Well, in the last message, we looked at the question, what is the purpose of the church? But uh, this message, we'll look at the question, who is the church? Or who composes the church? What is the character of the church? Now, this is a very important question because there's great confusion about it today. And there, in our context, there seem to be two uh, main misunderstandings of who composes the church. On the one hand, you have a view that says that anyone who professes a simple faith in Jesus and maybe prays to ask Jesus into their heart and agrees to join the church should be a church member. So simple profession and joining the church. Of course, the problem with this is often those who think that that's the who the church is, they don't look for true repentance, genuine conversion, a changed life, that all there is is there's a confession on paper, but it, Christ doesn't make any difference in their lives. This is easy believisms, and this fills the church with people who say that they're Christians, but there's no evidence in their life that they are. So that's one error. Another error that we see in answering this question is a more historical one, and it's one that has a long history in the history of Christianity. And it says that genuine believers who repent of their sins should join the church, but so should their infants join the church. And of course, this is a uh, Presbyterianism teaches this, Anglicanism, Methodism, Lutheranism, almost every other group but Baptists. In fact, historically, every other group but Baptist after the Protestant Reformation. And so I want to, we need to consider this. Um, what they believed was this historic view that you baptize and you include in the church believers and their children they believe that the church is a mixed body, or should be. The church should be mixed with believers and unbelievers in it. And so these are the two pitfalls. One pitfall is to believe that true conversion doesn't necessarily lead to a holy life, a changed life. And the other pitfall is to believe that the true church should be composed and is rightfully composed of believers and unbelievers, believers, and their children, whether or not they have actually been converted. And of course, there's mixtures of views in, in that other per perspective. And I'll just, I want to make sure you all understand, I, I dearly love our, my Presbyterian brothers. I have great Presbyterian friends and frankly feel closer to them than some Baptist friends that I have. And so there's much in common between a Reformed Baptist and a Presbyterian, but all the more reason to uh, raise this question and deal with it out of the scriptures here for us so that we can understand what the Bible says about it. Uh, so in response to this, both of those mistakes, both of those errors, let's consider three things. First, that the Bible teaches that the church should only be composed of converted people. The Bible teaches that the church should only be composed of converted people. Second, we need to look at what the Bible teaches about conversion. What is conversion? How do you know if you're converted? What does the Bible teach about conversion? Third, we'll look at some of the implications of a converted church membership. So if, if this is right, that the church should only be made up of those who are truly converted, those who have, been, who have repented of their sins, who have a new life, then what implications are that in the local church? How does that change the character of the church. And so if you will, please get out your Bibles and turn with me again to Acts chapter 2. And this time we'll begin reading in verse 36. So we'll start earlier than we did last time. Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 36, where Peter is preaching this sermon of Pentecost. And he's gone through much of the history uh, of uh, even of scripture and of crucifixion of Christ and of his resurrection. And then verse 36, uh, he says this, and he's speaking to Jews. And these are Jews who had just crucified Christ, right? And here's what he says. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. 
Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. Don't miss that. They heard this, they murdered Jesus, and they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Now look at verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for your church. But we thank you, Father, that your church is composed of those who are genuinely converted. That there's a work of grace in the hearts of your chosen people by the effective power of the Holy Spirit to apply Christ to them. And that it is these people who should compose a local church. Help us to understand your word, that our minds and our hearts and our lives would be shaped by it, and that we would honor you and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, again, this passage we've just read in Acts 2 is a paradigm. So it's a, it's a model for the church to follow. And it describes what the new covenant church did right after Pentecost, right after God had poured out his Holy Spirit in a unique way, in, in, in a new covenant way. And here we see God establishing a model for the church to follow. And all through chapter 2, Peter's been preaching the gospel to them. And then in verse 36, which we just read, Peter convicts them of sin. He says, this Jesus whom you crucified. And then in verse 37, which we just read, they're convicted of sin. They were cut to the heart. And then in verse 39, preach, Peter preaches the gospel to them. So he's convicted them of sin. They were cut to the heart. Now he preaches the gospel. What does he say? The promise is for you. What promise? It's a gospel promise. The promise of salvation in Jesus. This promise is for you that's applied by the Holy Spirit and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Now, those who baptize their children love to use this verse. So if you've ever talked to some who, who believe in infant baptism, they'll point you here and they'll say, look, see what it says? The promise is for you and for your children. But I would submit we need to keep reading because if you keep reading, it says this promise is for you and your children and everyone who is far off. So it's for you, your children, and all people. But then it qualifies everything by saying everyone, that is only those who the Lord our God calls. So the promise is to you and your children and everyone who's far off. What's the promise? If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved and repent of your sins. That's the promise, right? And that's true for you, and that's true for your children, and that's true for everyone who's far off, but only those who the Lord calls actually receive the promise. That's what Peter's saying. But now, now verse 41 is crucial, because it says, so those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Who was baptized? Only those who received the word of the gospel. Who was added to the church? Only those who received the word. Those who internalized the word. Those who laid hold of the promise. Only those who truly believed and repented. Now skip down and look at verse 47. Here it says, They were praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to their number day by day, those who are being saved. Only those who are being saved. Now, some people will say, well, that's the New Testament church, and so only new converts were... But if infant baptism was believed and practiced, they would be adding those who are being saved and their children, <laughs> right? They could be baptizing children even now, even though it's Acts in the early church, because adults were converted, but their children weren't baptized. It says he added to their number. That is the number of what? The number of the church. He added to the number of those in the church, which is, by the way, an argument for a church role. They had a number. They knew who was in the church. It was very definite. Individuals were counted. 
And God was adding to that number day by day only those who were being saved. And so we learn from this that the church should only be composed of those who are actually saved, those who are genuinely converted. Sometimes this is called regenerate church membership. Now, other places in the Bible teach this, and I want us to look at a few other ways that the Scripture teaches this truth so you can see how full it is. Uh, Turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews 8, where the Bible speaks of the new covenant, and it talks about what kind of people are in the new covenant. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, where God says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. And then he says, I will put my laws into their minds. That's those in the new covenant have God's laws written or put into their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Now pay attention here. And they shall not teach each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. So this isn't saying you won't teach. This is saying you won't have to tell anyone in the new covenant that they need to know the Lord. Why? Because they already know him. They know him already. From the least of them to the greatest, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. These are people who are forgiven redeemed by the blood of Jesus, who have the law of God written on their hearts, which means they're repentant. They love the Lord their God. They love men. And every one of the new covenant knows the Lord. Now that's different than the old covenant. The old covenant was a mixed body, like Presbyterians think the new, and all the others think the new covenant is. The old covenant had believers and lost people in it all at the same time, but the new covenant's different. The new covenant is only composed of converted people. Therefore, the New Covenant Church ought to only be composed of those who are converted. You see the connection? In the New Covenant, only those who are converted are in the New Covenant. Therefore, only those in the New Covenant Church, uh, only those who are converted ought to be in the New Covenant Church. So that's the first argument, is from the nature of the New Covenant. There's a second argument for a believer's church or a converted church. And it comes from the way Paul addresses all the churches in his letters. How does he speak to them? We'll, we'll look at a few of places, but first look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 2 through 9, where Paul is addressing the church at Corinth. And he speaks to them in a certain way. He addresses them as believers, as though they have all believed, as though they've all repented of their sins. All of them in the church. That's who he's talking to. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 2 through 9. Paul says, to the church of God. So there's a word church of God that is in Corinth. So it's a particular local church in Corinth. To those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are are believers. They're sanctified. That means they've been regenerated. They've been justified. They're called. They've been effectually called by God. They have themselves called upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you, because the grace of God, because of the grace of God that was given you in Jesus Christ. So grace was given to them in Christ Jesus. That in every way you were enriched in him. In every way you were enriched in him. In all speech and all knowledge, even as a testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you're not lacking any spiritual gift. They're not lacking any spiritual gift. As you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end. Who is it that God sustains to the end? Only believers. This is who he's talking to. Guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So this proves that Paul believed when he was addressing the Corinthian church that he was addressing people who ought to all be believers. Believers. 
They all ought to be believers. That's what they've all said that they are. And so he's addressing them as believers. There are other texts that teach this same thing. And I'll just read them to you. If you can turn quickly, you can turn there. But listen to other letters. This is not an isolated phenomenon in Paul. In Ephesians, Paul addresses the church at Ephesus. And in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1, he says, To the saints who are faithful in Ephesus in Jesus Christ. So they're called saints. They're called faithful. Then in Colossians 1-2, Paul addresses his letter to the church of Colossae, and he says, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. Then in Philippians 1-1, Paul addresses his letter to, to Philippi, and he says, to the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. So Paul believed all the local churches were supposed to be composed of believers, saints, brothers, those who are called, those who are regenerate. This is a very strong argument for regenerate church membership. That everyone in the church ought to be converted. Now, I want to be clear here. Paul isn't saying that every individual was, because we know some of these in these churches weren't believers. They were in rebellion against God, and we see the way he was addressing them uh, in the letters, calling them to repentance of sin and warning them against falling away from Christ. What he was saying was, you should all be, because you've all confessed to be. This was a judgment of charity. He was taking them at their word. So that's the second argument for regenerate church membership. First, we've seen the new covenant is a, is a believer's only covenant. Second, we've seen that Paul addresses local churches as though they're full of only believers. Third, the scriptures teach that there are false professors who are not truly part of God's people. That is, there are people who say that they belong to Christ, but they're not really part of God's people, which shows you that God's true people are only those who are regenerate. Uh, Look with me at Matthew 7, if you will, verse 21, where Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and he's giving a warning here at the end of his sermon. He's preached about the nature of the true kingdom of God as it's in the hearts of men and all these qualities of love and all the beatitudes. But then he warns them at the end of this sermon, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So there are people who say, Lord, Lord, which, by the way, that repetition, Lord, Lord, is a term of affection and endearment. So you might cry out to God with sincerity in the way you sound and repeat it, Lord, Lord, and you you refer to him affectionately, and yet you don't do the will of the Father. So not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but who enters? The only the ones who do the will of the Father who is in heaven. And then verse 22, on that day, many, that is on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Not I stopped knowing you. Not I used to know you, but... Now I don't. He never knew them. Though they did many mighty works, so they cried out, Lord, Lord. And on Judgment Day, I would imagine there are many baptized church members who take the Lord's Supper, who live a moral, basically moral life, and they cried out, Lord, Lord, but they don't do the will of the Father. They haven't sincerely repented of their sins. They don't love God and love men. And he will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Now, here's really important. In verse 23, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of, what's the word? Lawlessness. So what's the will of the Father? Lawfulness. Right? Because in verse 23, or 21, he says, only the one who does the will of my Father will enter the kingdom. But those who work lawlessness will not. So we're not under the law as a way to be saved or justified before God, but we are under the law of Christ, which is 
The moral law of God, summarized in the Ten Commandments, delivered to us through the hand of Jesus as a guide to our obedience. Now, now look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, another place where we see this example of, of false professors who are not truly part of God's people. And here they're not truly part of the church. Paul says, or rather they don't have a right to be members of the church. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 11. Paul says, now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who, now look at this, bears the name of brother, or your translation may say so-called brother. That is a brother in name only, someone who calls himself a Christian. I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Purge the evil person from among you. Those are strong words. And what Paul is saying is there are people who call themselves brothers, but they're in the church and they have a life characterized by sexual immorality, greed, idolatry, reviling, drunkenness. These are sins that they've given themselves to. And what, what does Paul say to do to people like that? He says, purge them. Why? So this is very practical and, it, and hopefully, in a sense, causing self-reflection even. But it's also, there's a theological principle here. And that is, he says to purge the evil person from them because they have no right to be members of the church. The only ones who have a right to be baptized and to join the church are those who are converted, those who live holy lives. If you don't live a holy life and you lose your, your good confession, Paul says, purge the evil person from among you. So unbelievers should not be members of the church. There's another place. Turn with me to 2 Timothy 2.19. We're considering who is the church, and I'm arguing the church, the local church, ought to be composed only of converted people. 2 Timothy 2.19, where Paul speaks of those who are false believers and are not legitimately part of God's people. Paul says, But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. So God knows which of his people belong to him. And then Paul says, let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So if you call out to God, well, God knows who, who belongs to him among those who call out to God. But let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity, turn from your sin. And so here, here we see that only, only those who are repentant, who are converted, are his. And there's one more passage. This is 1 John 2.19, which makes clear what's going on here, where the Apostle John describes a group of people who were members of the church, but who left. So the Apostle John is talking about some people who were part of a local church, and they, they left. And here's what he says. They went out from us, but they were not of us. So they left, but they weren't really part of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out so that it might become plain that they are not of us. So there is very clear that true, tr tr the true church are, those who are, only, are only those who are converted. And the local church ought to be composed only of those. And if unconverted people happen to be baptized and join the church and they seem like Christians for a while, they're not rightful members. And, they, and ultimately, if the sin shows itself enough, they're to be put out of the church. And so that's the third argument for ch regenerate church membership. False professors of Christ are imposters and illegitimate members of the church of the Lord Jesus. So there's the first major point tonight, that the Bible teaches that the church is only composed of converted people. That there's to, only to be a regenerate church membership. 
The churches should only have those who have actually repented of their sins, not just those who call out to Christ. And that means only true believers should be members of the church because faith works, and the faith without works is dead. So that's the first point. But second, we need to understand what the Bible teaches about conversion. So look with me in Acts 2 one more time. And here we see an example of conversion. Now the definition of conversion is this. Conversion means faith in Christ and repentance of your sin. Faith in Christ and repentance of sin. A person who believes in Jesus and repents of his sins is converted. And the instruments of conversion are law and gospel. So how does God apply conversion to you? Through the law and through the gospel. We have to know the law to be convicted of our sins. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin, the Bible says. You have to know the gospel to know how Christ has paid for your sins and satisfied the demands of the law. And so you believe in Christ for redemption in the gospel, and the law shows you how to repent of your sins. And Acts 2.36 shows us that Peter preached the law to the Jews. We just saw this, but look at it again. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And so Paul is convicting these Jews of murder. They murdered the Lord of glory. They killed the king. They broke God's law. They deserve to die in their sins. Paul's preaching the law. How about you? Do you realize that you have murdered Jesus? What are your sins? What are the sins of your mind and your heart, the sins of your hands, the sins of your mouth? Every time you speak an unkind or cruel or hateful word to someone made in the image of God, you are murdering Jesus. Every time you lie or covet or commit adultery in mind, heart or hands, you're murdering Jesus because you're treating another person hatefully and like they're objects for your own pleasure or to serve you. And you deserve to die and to suffer in hell for all eternity where the Bible says the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And the Bible says the smoke of their torment will ascend day and night forever and ever, and there is no rest because you've murdered the Lord of glory and you've offended an infinitely holy God who infinitely hates sin. And each time you sin, you're saying that Jesus should be murdered. Kill him twice. Hang him on the cross again. That's what your heart is saying. And then verse 37 says that when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. That's the Holy Spirit. That they were cut to the heart. They agreed. That's what that means. And were convicted that what they did was murder Christ and it's a terrible sin. They agreed with the law. They agreed with the conviction of sin. Hard-hearted people are not cut to the heart. They justify their sins. That's what hard-hearted people do. They say, ah, it's not that bad. You're making too much of this. Or they deserved it. They blame shift. They justify. But these Jews agreed that they deserved to die. They agreed with the law that their sins are wicked. How about you? Do you agree with the law? That it's good and holy? Do you agree with God? That what you deserve in yourself is to die? that you have no rights before the throne of a holy God. Do you feel, and if you can't feel, do you at least believe at some level your guilt and shame? How your sins have alienated you from God, how you deserve death. Maybe you don't try to justify your sins. You don't try to shift the blame for your sins. You accept blame and you're cut to the heart just like these at Pentecost, and you know that you are a guilty, shameful sinner, and you deserve the just penalty for your sins. And you stand with God and basically condemning yourself. 
for your sin. If that's you, there's very good news because that is, is supernatural. If you agree with God that you're guilty, that is good news. And if you agree with God that you deserve to die and that you need a Savior, that is good news. But Peter's sermon doesn't stop with the law. It goes on to the gospel. The law and the gospel are instruments of conversion. In Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39, Peter preaches the gospel. And what does he say? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, this, this verse would be better translated like this. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ because of the forgiveness of your sins. The word for in Greek is just like in English. It can mean because or in order to. And here it clearly has to mean because of. That is, how can you repent? And why would you ever seek baptism? Because Christ has forgiven you. You murdered him. But he, he looks upon you with love in his eyes and grace in his voice. And he says, I forgive you on the basis of my blood and righteousness if you just cast yourself upon my mercy. And I receive you to myself and I give you life eternal and I promise you me the best of all beings. I promise myself to you and I promise life to you. And I love you and I'm for you and not against you if you just come to me. And so what Peter's saying here is repent and be baptized because you know how much you've been forgiven. If you know how much you've sinned under the law and you know how much you've been given under the gospel, you will love Jesus. And that's what repentance is. Looking to Christ, you see your sin and its ugliness and its horror and you see Christ and his goodness and his grace and you loathe your sin. You hate it and you forsake it and you grieve it. And you run to Jesus and you find rest in Jesus. How about you? Do you believe that Christ's bloody death on the cross is enough to forgive you? Even you, no matter what you have done. But your sins can't stand against his infinite sufficiency to wash you of all of your guilt. Do you believe that Jesus forgives murderers like you? He forgave David who murdered Uriah? Do you believe that he forgives thieves like you? He freely forgave the thief on the cross and he promised the thief life that very day. Do you believe he forgives adulterers just like you? He forgave the adulterous woman and she wiped his feet with her hair and her tears and Jesus said to her, the one who is forgiven much loves much. If you know how much you've been forgiven of your sins against the law, through the grace of the gospel, you'll love much, and that's what repentance is. Turning to Christ and loving him because you, he has first loved you. And Jesus freely appeals to you in the gospel, and he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly of heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you're burdened by the guilt and the shame of your sin, go to him, he'll take them. He said, I'll take them. But then you have to take something from him, and what you have to take from him is a yoke. And it's being yoked to him to learn how to live from him, to learn how to love. And it says he's gentle, he's not harsh, he's not a, a cruel teacher. He won't beat you when, it, when you get it wrong. He teaches you one step at a time, trains you to be like himself. That's repentance. Knowing his love, you love him and keep his commandments. And if you repent, two things will happen. You will begin to keep the commandments of God, the moral law, but you'll also keep the positive laws of the new covenant. That means you'll seek baptism. And you'll seek church membership because you love him and you love his bride. And if you're convicted by the law and if you believe the gospel and if you repent of your sins, then you, you and only you have a right to baptism and church membership. And conversion is three things. So now let's just think about this. 
to being sincerely convicted by God's law. Second, it's trusting that Jesus can save you from your sins and judgment. And third, it's humili- the humiliation of the law and the sweet comfort of the gospel makes you love Jesus. You see how these two things, law which humiliates and gospel which comforts, leads to love and joy and repentance. And so you see how law and gospel are instruments of conversion. And that's the second main point for tonight. We've seen that the Bible teaches what conversion is. It's faith in Jesus to forgive me of my sins and it's repentance of my sins with the law of God as my guide, not to be saved, but to to how to express my love for the Christ who bought me. But thirdly tonight, let's, with that, let's keep thinking about the church. We need to consider some implications of a converted church membership. I want to give you seven implications. If the church is full of people who are genuinely saved, those who really believe Jesus and have repented of their sins, I want to give you seven implications. First, we should only baptize those who have been converted. Through believers, this is believers' baptism. Baptism is a gateway of of membership into the local church. Listen to 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It says, for in one spirit, that is a Holy Spirit who saves us, we were all baptized into one body. So we're only those who have the spirit for salvation are to be baptized into one body. We shouldn't baptize only those who have prayed a prayer to ask Jesus into their hearts or just prayed. So, you know, the Pharisee prayed a prayer at the temple. It was totally insincere. Prayers don't save you. Now, the sinner's prayer will that beats your chest and that says, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I have no right to even go before you pour out your grace upon you. Do you see how that's, the law? that's accepting the law and the gospel is what that is. And this also means we shouldn't baptize infants. We're only to baptize true disciples. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Who are to baptize? Only those who are disciples. Only those who are converted. So that's the first implication baptism is of believers only. A second implication of a converted church is congregational church government. Here's what that means. The Bible teaches, and we don't have time to look at it all tonight, but the the church should choose its leaders. The church should vote on its elders. The church should vote on its deacons. The church should vote on its members, and the church should also vote if it's going to excommunicate someone or put them out. Now, if you don't have a converted church, what kind of decisions is that church going to make? If it's full of lost people, it's going to choose bad leaders. It's not going to take its responsibility seriously about membership, and it's not going to think wisely about discipline. You need a converted church to have a congregational church government. That's the second implication. Third implication of a converted church membership is a a true confession of faith. That is, if, if the church has a full orthodox biblical confession of faith, it will only keep holding to that confession as long as the people in it are converted. What happens if the church gets filled with lost people and it has a strong, good orthodox confession? They stop loving it, the confession. They start tinkering with it or wanting to change parts or disagreeing with it and moving away from it. And, and usually, I mean, it's things like this. It's they start today questioning, is, is homosexuality really wrong? I mean, you know, that's where today it tends to start. Or hard doctrines like hell and sin and repentance start to fall by the wayside. Or they want to start teaching that everyone will eventually end up in heaven, or you don't really have to repent or change as a Christian. Those are hard teachings, and lost people don't like them. And if the church gets filled with lost people, it will jettison its orthodox confession. And that's not a theory. That happens in church history. We could trace the history of denominations, and I'll just tell you, those that baptize their babies, over the the generations, they fill their churches with lost people 
and they start to lose orthodoxy. Many don't know that even the history of Presbyterianism began as Calvinistic, and then it moved to become Arminian, believe it or not. Presbyterians were Arminians for a long time, and then they became Socinians, and then they became, they just lost the faith completely. They don't exist in orthodox form in England. And I think part of the reason is they didn't have a converted membership to hold to an orthodox confession of faith. That's a third implication. You need a regenerate church membership to keep confessing the whole Bible. A fourth implication of a converted membership is church discipline. Think of this. If we believe that the church should only be composed of converted people, and then if someone starts to give evidence that they're not converted, it only makes sense to discipline them and remove them from the church. You see the connection? Put differently, if you don't believe that conversion is necessary to be a church member, then why would you discipline anyone for giving evidence that they're not converted? It makes no sense to discipline someone for having a life that shows they're not converted if you don't even need to be converted to join. You see? So a fourth implication of a converted church membership is it supports the Bible's teaching about discipline, which is through it. We we, we didn't look at that tonight, but it's thoroughly there. A fifth implication of a converted church membership is a church becomes a place where it can fulfill its three purposes. All those we just talked about in the first message are impossible unless the church is converted. The church can be a place where you really have fellowship and or have discipleship in Christ where weaker believers can be strengthened and grow if the church is a regenerate church. It can be a place of love and joy and grace and sin and repentance. And all the members will be surrounded by each other and strengthen each other to grow up into godliness. That's only possible if the church has saved people in it. That's the fifth implication. The sixth implication of a converted church membership is evangelism and missions. Think about this. Some traditions of Christianity believe that the church grows politically, not through conversion. I'll give you an example of this. Uh, There's a, I could mention his name privately to you later if you want, because it's not a secret, but there's someone who believes in basically changing the world through politics. There are many who teach this, but he he kind of tried to take over a town. He put his church in there and they've taken over the city government and they're trying to get laws changed and they're pushing to change the culture that way. And that's what they believe. And yet, if what we want is a converted church membership. We'll think the church grows through conversions, which means you preach the gospel, preach the law and the gospel. You don't think you can form the church through politics. Rather, you proclaim the gospel and the Lord causes the church to grow. And so this implication of a converted church membership is evangelism and missions. A seventh and final implication of of a converted church membership is that only a converted church can worship God. If the church is full of lost people, how can they worship? They can't. There's no sincere faith. There's no true repentance. And so you have to have a converted church to fulfill its main purpose, which is to worship. And so the church can only fulfill any of its purposes and finally to glorify God if it's made up of those who are genuinely converted. That is, they sincerely believe in Jesus and they've repented of their sins. And so the Bible teaches that the church is a converted church. Are you converted? Do you know Christ? If not, nothing stops you from right now coming to him and receiving his grace. Nothing but yourself. Casting yourself on his mercy and he'll save you if you just come to him. And if you come to him, then join a local church through baptism and church membership where you can worship the Lord with other believers and be strengthened to walk alongside of them as you journey from grace to glory. Let's close with prayer. Father God, we do thank you again for the church and for your purpose in it. We thank you for who the church is.
that it's those who have been filled with the Spirit, who've been effectually called, those who've been justified, who are to be associated in local congregations, that they might worship you and encourage each other and do the work of missions. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to defend these truths, to live according to them. But also, Father, for, for any who may not be converted, Lord, I pray that you'd save them according to your great power and mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.